Diese Lisa. Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. Okay, now there is a record. <lacht> um, once again, we are women in tech, we are supporting women in technology or in tech jobs. And we had a short call with Marie and Lisa a couple of weeks ago um, about how to, how we could support um, women in tech, especially in uh, here in this region, in Karlsruhe, with both of our organizations, your company and our organization are originally from Karlsruhe, which is nice. And yeah, now I lost a bit my, <laughs> what I wanted to say. Um, well, it's nice that we all come together. I just like to, wanted to shortly introduce uh, our organization, We're Women in Tech, and um, yeah, Lisa, you uh, told us you wanted to talk about how you made up your career. Uh, you have about 20 years of uh, experience in user experience, uh, user experience, right? And yeah, so I'll just give you the mic right now and let you talk. I think you prepared it already quite well and I probably don't, won't ask too much unless I'm gonna get curious and you guys are of course also invited to just jump in. So, and if you want, you can turn your webcams on as well. I mean, you can see us, so it's yeah, nice it would to be see nice other faces as well. Uh, so don't be shy. You can turn your webcam on as well. So yeah, great. Hi, Christina. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for that introduction, Lucia. And yes, um, as people, if you're comfortable, we welcome having your cameras on, uh, but it's totally fine um, um, if you don't want to. Uh, I'll be sharing more about user experience, what that is, and how I've used some of the methods from user experience, UX, uh, to help answer que questions I've had in my own career. Um, you're welcome to interrupt me as I'm talking. I'll start sharing slides in a moment. And we also have a chat feature. So if you just want to uh, type something in the chat, as you already have, that's perfect. Uh, feel free to, to make comments there, and I'll, I'll take, uh, take a look um, as I'm going through my presentation. All right, one moment. Great, thanks again, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really going to be talking about uh, what's called design thinking today. And design thinking is a framework of uh, how you can learn about people and understand their needs and sort of decide what to build. It's one of the techniques we use when building software products. Uh, but design thinking is really great because you can apply it also to your own life. And so let's get into it. Um, to get things kicked off, I'll obviously share a little bit more about my background, how I got into user experience, and then in the middle section, I'll really share some specific examples of questions I've had in my career or questions I've had from uh, team members I work with today when uh, they're looking to grow and develop their own careers and use design thinking mindsets to, to approach, um, approach problems. I think many of us have all faced uh, really common challenges. Uh, and then to wrap things up, I have a small activity. It will maybe take five, maybe 10 minutes uh, that really is sort of utilizing those same principles of how do you reflect and understand what, your, what motivates you, what you care about in your career. And hopefully then following today's talk is something that you can continue to reflect on and use uh, moving forward. Great. All right, so user experience, what is it about? Um, this is a picture of me from, ooh, I think it might be 13 years ago now. It's a picture is a little bit old. I was quite young, um, but this is one of my favorite activities to do in user experience, which is talking to real people out there in the world and understanding how they use technology. And so I'm with a woman here and we've unpacked her bag and what I mean by that is I was working on a project where we wanted to understand um, how people use laptops and mobile phones and how do they move about their day, when do they use their phone, when do they use their laptop. And one of the activities we did as part of that research 
was have people literally take the bag they had brought with them to this office and start describing everything that they carry with them. And when you have people start to talk not only about the technology, but also about, you know, the pet, their favorite pens or their person, uh, the diary or the books that they carry around with them, you really get a much more nuanced view of what's motivating people. And that deeper understanding is what's absolutely essential for how to think about building a product or a service. I think it's one thing to, um, you know, send out surveys, which is something that uh, my team definitely does, and you can kind of get big data sets, but really talking to people directly one-on-one -on -one is the most um, quintessential way to really deeply understand how people go about in the world, what's important to them, and uh, this is one of my absolute favorite parts of working in user experience. Um, and currently today, I work at LogMeIn. Uh, so LogMeIn is an international software as a service company. Um, we are using one of LogMeIn's products today that my team works on, which is GoToMeeting. Uh, LogMeIn also offers other products, such as LastPass, which is for password management, and Bold360, which is a tool for businesses to have like a chatbot service um, on their application. And so LogMeIn um, is about 3,000 employees. I work here in the Karlsruhe office, uh, but as you can tell, the big smile and the accent, I'm from the United States, uh, but I moved to Karlsruhe about four years ago, honestly, thanks to, to Marie um, and, and her team for helping uh, kind of sell me on Karlsruhe in Germany. I, you know, I'd had these big, big dreams of moving to Berlin and the big city, but I absolutely love it here in the South. And I don't regret at all that I moved to Karlsruhe, even though people are always shocked that an American is living here, but I think it's wonderful. Um, we also have offices in Dresden and in München. Uh, I deeply miss the LogMeIn offices, so like many of you, we are in a work-from-home, remote work situation this year. Um, I think, as we all know, this has been a really tough year, uh, so I just wanted to briefly share some pictures of our team. Um, on the left, uh, this is a mix of user experience and engineering folks, and I don't know why everyone's smiling, but we're, we're watching a research session where we're um, observing someone you go to meeting. And so, right, one of the aspects of evaluating our products is identifying what are the pain points, right? We had someone earlier who was like, hey, is my audio working? We want to build our products in ways where uh, it's just you know what's going on and uh, you don't have to struggle so much. And on the right hand side is a team lunch. I deeply miss our team lunches. You may be wondering what those strange yellow bags are on the table. Those are Frito chips, which um, are uh, crisp potato chips uh, from the United States. And I don't want to say it's a common food in the United States, but we have something called Frito pie, which is where you take the crisps and you put them on chili and you add cheese and toppings. And I know it sounds really horrible, but I promise you it's quite good. So that was our Frito pie lunch. All right. Yeah, I hope the offices open open up soon again. All right, getting getting back on track. So UX, as I've just been uh, explaining, we're really interested in people, what they need, what they care about, and then from that research, understanding, or excuse me, ideating and deciding what should we build to solve those needs. Um, I will share the slides out afterwards. Uh, I know, obviously, I really appreciate um, those of you who are German first or German language speakers listening to me in English, um, but I've added a link uh, to a German website that describes user experience and the various roles here. Um, and if you're more interested in user experience, I can definitely recommend uh, the following book, The Design of Everyday Things. So let me do kind of a quick side note and not give you a full history of UX, but I, I do think UX is interesting because while it's a new field in general, like the term has only been around since 1995, the history of understanding people and optimizing solutions and services for those people has been around definitely since the 1900s, since industrialization and really took off in the 1940s after World War II. Um, and so on the right-hand side, I, have a, I took a 
a screenshot from a movie that I really like called Kitchen Stories. And what you see here is a fictional scene, but it's based on uh, real research that happened in Sweden in the 1940s. So Swedish researchers wanted to understand housewives and how they could design kitchens. I don't know if this was sponsored by IKEA or not, but how they could design kitchens so that a woman, typically a woman, could move um, within the kitchen area to you know, be most efficient with cooking and cleaning, et cetera. And so the idea here with the man in the chair in the corner is that he is the neutral observer, he is the scientist, he is the researcher, and he is going to spend hours watching the woman, or in this case, a man, using the kitchen, right? So this is uh, early, early ways that people were trying to understand humans. And this is just a really great movie. It's uh, based on this idea of the Swedish research, but uh, fictionalizes it, and so it uh, has some, some good humor uh, in it. All right, so user experience. I've always known that I've been interested in user experience. Um, so I will say, I think I'm lucky in some ways that uh, I haven't ever career switched. Like even when I was a teenager, I absolutely loved the social side of computers, meaning like, how do I get to talk to people online? And how do, can I exchange messages and share music and files? So understanding people and computers uh, has always been part of my DNA. And I think if you look at like my LinkedIn profile or as I have it outlined here, my career trajectory looks pretty boring in the sense of like, well, it looks like you kind of did everything right. You went to university and got a degree that allowed you to move to San Francisco where I had my first jobs in technology. Um, so my first jobs were in user interface design and helping build e-commerce websites. And then I moved on to get an advanced degree. So I got my PhD. So it wasn't that great. I'm just growing my skills and my education in the field. And then since that time, worked for, worked for some really great tech companies. Uh, so yeah, I'm, so when I look at it like this, I'm like, wow, that seems really great. Um, what could I possibly have to share? Or am I so lucky or so smart compared to other people? Absolutely not. As you all know, what things look like on the surface is very different sort of than, than the reality that um, we all experience uh, in our lives. And so um, this visual is really meant to represent the confusion, the lack of clarity, the I don't know how to kind of move on to the next step um, that I've often felt Maybe I'll even say on a, on a daily basis, I'm being a little bit glib, but it, it, all, it hasn't been so clear. Um, you know, we all have different personality styles, even though um, I'm presenting tonight and I'm being social and being bold. I'm actually someone who's very introverted. I um, find it hard to ask for what I want. I'm not always comfortable in large group social situations, right? We all have our different styles. And what I, you know, what I found over time, again, this will bring it back to design thinking, is that when you learn to empathize and accept who you are and sort of the, the ways you like to work and your comfort level with different activities, that you don't always have to follow the mold or um, try and be like other people, that there are ways to solve these complex career problems that don't mean you have to change yourself or um, beat yourself up for not doing things right. And so I'll move on next to talking about a few examples for, uh, for when I've had a tough time getting a job, not knowing how to get a promotion, and sort of my shift into management and how I've used design thinking as a mindset to help me move forward when, when I have felt um, anxiety and confusion. And so this terminology, design thinking, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a framework for how uh, companies and teams approach solving problems where there's many possible solutions. And it really starts with understanding the context. And what I mean by that, uh, 
in regards to building products is we're usually out there talking to users, as I showed you in the beginning, with uh, having the woman unpack her, her backpack, her purse, uh, that we really want to understand people's lives and then be generative. And so when we're trying to define what we should build, the first goal is actually not to find the, the one right answer, but it's to be creative and really think broadly. And that's what's really great about design thinking is that it doesn't force you to find one right solution. It forces you actually to explore many possible options, but then move quickly to action and then adjust from there. So really, you might hear terms like fail fast, um, test and learn, it be iterative. These are all examples of design thinking that you can apply uh, to your own life and to your own career. Yeah. So, okay, personal story time. And yeah, it's always, ugh, it's always hard like sharing personal stories. But uh, one of the hardest uh, times in my life was when I was working on my PhD, I took a really long time. Graduate school is hard. Uh, and I was essentially out of the workforce for about six years. And so some of you may be able to relate um, whether you've had to care for a family member or maybe you've had uh, children and you're taking time to care for those children. You essentially become de-skilled, right? You're, for six years, I did not have a tech job. Um, sure, I was doing things academically related to user experience. But as we all know, university work, at least in um, PhD programs in the United States, I know it's different here in, in Europe, but in the United States, academics and um, businesses and corporations aren't as closely linked together as they are here in Europe. And so as I was graduating, um, it was really hard to find a job, right? So who is going to want someone who has a really high degree? So I have a PhD, okay, yay me, that's super awesome. But I have no recent tech work experience and we all know tech moves fast, there's new tools every year, there's new techniques. I have nothing to show that uh, demonstrates recent experience. And so, of course, I started thinking about, well, the common advice you hear is go out and use your network. So attend meetups like we're doing tonight, which are great. Um, go out there, be social, you know, contact people, maybe on LinkedIn. At this point in my life, uh, LinkedIn wasn't yet a thing, so I, I didn't have that option. Um, but what I found, and you know, and this again gets back to sort of recognizing what works for you and what you're comfortable with. I actually found I really just liked applying for jobs online and perfecting my portfolio and the story I was telling through online means. And so while you typically hear that, oh, you know, you send your resume out um, online, no one's ever going to look at it, you know, it just goes into a black void and that's totally useless. I have to say I've, I've, uh, my last three jobs were all because I applied online with no personal connection. And so this is not to dismiss the power of uh, personal connections. I believe personal connections are really important. But when I talk about experimenting with your approach, you have to find what works for you. And so for me, really uh, diving deep and learning to sort of perfect how I told my story uh, through portfolios, through cover letters, that was where I was really comfortable, and that's where I focused my time. Yes, and <laughs> Regina just made a comment. Personal connections are really important. I completely agree. Um, and I certainly have used um, personal connections later in my career to participate in conferences. I'm at this meetup only because of personal connections. So I definitely do not want you to leave here um, thinking I, I am dismissing the power of kind of what we're doing here today. What I'm, uh, what I'm offering is that there's other approaches that uh, you can also try. All right. And then Lucia asked, did I have any mentors? Uh, I have tried the mentorship approach. So at my previous job, they were um, they had a great mentorship program where they would connect you to more senior leaders. Um, and there are many senior women at uh, this is at Intel Corporation. 
Um, but for me, what I found most helpful was when I was working directly with someone with more seniority. So for me, um, again, this is my issues personally. Uh, I'm quite shy and I have a hard time opening up to someone that I don't know as well, uh, especially on sort of an ongoing relationship uh, basis. And so what I needed for my mentorship to really work is to have a basis in a particular project. And so I think mentors are great and that's actually going to hit on one of my following points. Um, but for me, I needed it to be based in real work that I was already doing as opposed to something that was more abstract. That's a great question. Next question. Um, and hello to my team members who, who helped me make this point who are on the call today. But um, right now I'm a manager and I get this question a lot, which is very helpful and which is a question I've had in my life as well, which is, how do I get a promotion? How do I sort of move to the next level? Um, and this is the aspect of the, uh, the aspect of design thinking that's really relevant here is that it's okay to be curious and ask. And so this is one of the things I really admire about the t my team members uh, who, I, who I work with today. They've been brave and they've asked. I have never asked once in my life how to get a promotion. I've been too nervous. I, you know, you always hear that women are told to speak up or you're, um, you hear things like, you own your career. I haven't felt comfortable with that. That, that doesn't work for me. Um, but what I, but in order to sort of, I'll say, I don't want to say pay it forward, but what I've been able to do since that time, even though I was too afraid to ask, I've now um, started with my team members to create a career framework at Log Me In that all of our user experience group can use. And so, you know, I think one of the things when you um, are shy like me uh, is that you have to remember that it is okay to be curious. And so, I can't say I've always followed my own advice, but reflecting back on things I would change, I would very much um, uh, kind of not change course, but uh, I would give myself the permission to ask the question. Like, because honestly, your team members, your managers, they want to help. You're not wasting their time. Everyone wants you to succeed. And so don't be shy about it. And this is one that I've I'm still working on today, but hopefully um, my team will will grow from uh, some of the, some of the work we're doing together. All right, how do I become a manager? Um, so this is actually reflecting on the the question Lucia mentioned. Um, I will say I I've always found like I do read management books sometimes, and you know I think I think they're interesting. I very much like working in an applied situation. And what I mean by that is once I'm in a project or I'm working with a few other people, those are the times where I feel I'm really learning and understanding. And I think the key point here is not to just partner with people you already work well with and like. I think that's really easy. Um, and you can still learn, of course, and you're having a great time. Uh, but I would push all of you to try and collaborate with people you don't naturally gravitate toward. So I remember early in my career, I was um, working on a project with a woman who I thought, oh, she's, um, she's not doing things by the book, right? Like I went to university and the, the book says that, uh, you know, the way we need to set up this research project is to do X, Y, Z in this format. And I was very attached to this particular method because this is what I had been taught in school. And this woman was kind of casual and I'll say kind of going off script. And I was like, what is she doing? Um, but it was then that I realized that the stories or the information that she was getting out of people was much more valuable and much more interesting because she was adjusting the way she talked to people sort of in the moment as opposed sticking to a fixed script. And so for me, that was a huge learning that sort of this notion of there's one, one right way, there, as you all know, there's definitely not one right way. And so I would push all of you to, to find people that maybe you're not 
understanding exactly why they're successful or why they're approaching problems in that same way and try and do projects with them and, and get to know them. And I think that's one of the key ways, and sorry, the topic here is how did I become a manager? Um, it was really through observation and paying attention to what I really liked out of the different managers I've had in my career. So, you know, I think in order to sort of get a management position, they, they, you often hear like, oh, you need to demonstrate leadership capabilities. I think that's true, but I would also say you don't have to be the only one or you can partner with someone and learn their leadership style and do projects together and both be successful. You don't need to, I'll say, keep it all to yourself or say, oh, I have to figure it out by myself. I have to prove myself. Work with others and you'll both grow. So, so that's really, I, I think, one of the key things about collaborating. Um, and then just to kind of close out this section, uh, again, thinking about design thinking and mindsets. Design thinking is all about pushing you into action and then learning from it and adjusting. So, you know, did I make the right choice? Was this the right job? You know, did I speak correctly in this meeting? Don't stress yourself out, even though I'm totally stretching myself out right now and <laughs> judging myself. Uh, but but learn learn from all of this, right? So there's no right decision. There's the decision you make, and then reflecting on it, and then deciding, ooh, did that feel right for me? Did I like that? Do I want to do something different? That's what design thinking is really all about. And thanks, you all, for the yeah the call out on collaboration. All right, cool. All right, let me just do a quick time check here. Okay, perfect. So. I'll pause here for a moment um, and see if there's uh, any more questions before we move um, into the activity. But basically, as, as you can see, my, my key points here are really be, be okay with yourself. Like it's totally okay to um, not be sort of the right thing, like the social butterfly or the, the smartest person in the room learn to work with it with these different mindsets and you'll find that you're able to to carve your own path hey regina did you want to ask a question oh and you're on mute if you're talking it's okay i i, I didn't want to ask a question it's okay <laughs> Okay. Okay. Cool. I just sorry. I was moving. No <laughs> All good. Yeah, I was moving different windows around, and sometimes in our meetings, um, how it works is that someone will turn on their camera when they want to ask a question, and so suddenly I was like, oh, I think Regina wants to ask. But all good. Okay. Cool. All right. So I think the next thing we can do is I have a short uh, career activity we can do together that, again, is really based off of design thinking principles. Okay. And what it is, sorry, I got a lot of windows happening here and I'm losing stuff on my screen. Um, okay. I'm going to map out uh, your current job satisfaction. And the goal of this exercise, uh, and really this takes less than five minutes, and I realize it's kind of hard to see right now, but don't worry, I will talk through everything. Um, but one of the things that can be really hard to um, do when you're sort of busy with life and work and um, sort of feeling like you want to change, but you're not sure what change you want, is to really pause for a moment and to use activities like this example here to reflect on what do you really care about? Like what's motivating you? What do you find satisfying? And so I'll make this diagram larger in a moment, but as you can see, there's eight kind of sections of this map here, all related to um, motivations or things you might find uh, important about your work, such as work-life balance or being able to sort of express who you are and be creative. And the idea is that you would kind of give the each section, each one of these eight pieces, an excellent, like, hey, things are excellent at my job in terms of communication 
or, hey, things are neutral with the uh, relationship I have with my manager and team, or, ooh, um, you know, I don't know, career development is poor. Lisa, Lisa hasn't uh, created that career document that she promised me yet. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll give that a thumbs down. And so what that ends up looking like is, this is just an example, this isn't reality, something like this. And the key point here is to really go with your gut reaction on each one of these items. Don't overthink it. Don't, oh, don't spend time being like, well, you know, I like this manager, but this other manager I have to work with isn't great. What's, what's your immediate reaction to, to each of these items on the map? And then following that, and this is something for you to do kind of on, on your own time as you wish, is this now sets you up to be able to think about changes you may want to make in your career or um, new projects you may want to try or, or new personal goals you may have. Um, so what I'm going to do, let's see, I think we can kind of do this two ways. You can kind of take a piece of paper and just do your own quick sketch of these items. Um, but I also made a, oops, I also made a Google link. One second. Uh, so if you want to do it online, um, you can make a copy of this document and uh, use it online. Let's see. I'll put this in the chat. So yeah, if you open up this Google link, um, don't fill out this specific version because this is public, so your name wouldn't be on it, but then everyone can see it, but make a copy of this file and you can use it if you'd like, or feel free to just use uh, pen and paper. Um, and so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll kind of just be quiet for about five or six minutes. Uh, I think the words on this on this map are purposefully a little bit vague, so feel free to interpret them as you want. Like, what does generating results exactly mean? Um, I think make your own interpretation based on sort of where you're at in your career or what, what's important to you. Did you make it a bit larger? Mm hmm I don't know if it's an eye issue or, <laughs> but no, yeah, yeah. Thank you, great. See if I can I think I'm glad that I'm self-employed because um, all of these sections are given double heads up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that did not work. Can everyone see it okay? Should I try and make the font bigger? Let me try and make the font bigger. Getting good. I, I can see it now. You can see it. Okay.
Great. Do people need a few more minutes or, um, yeah, a few more minutes? Okay. All right. Cool. Well, let's um, kind of, uh, I'll share sort of the next steps, which uh, really are more, again, um, homework for another time, and then we can um, move into, uh, continue on with Q&A. So yeah, after you do your reflection, and I was actually trying to do mine, I actually have not done this exercise yet because I was uh, busy putting together the presentation for today. Um, but, but really the next step here would be to, to think about this. So was there anything surprising? Did you, um, was there anything that you thought, oh, I hadn't even considered that, uh, you know, being creative was important to me, but, you know, once I, once I did this map, I suddenly saw that, ooh, I'm not, I'm not feeling good about that. Or, you know, just being able to see all of the pieces together. So in this example, you know, the fictional person is, Oh, I love my team. The climate and the culture of this office is great. I have great work-life balance, but ooh, my career development opportunities, not feeling like anything's happening there. So what do you do in these situations where, you know, you love the people you're working with? Um, this is actually, now that I'm sharing all this, this is similar to my last job. I absolutely loved the people I worked with at my last job and the projects were interesting, um, but the overall structure of the company was very bureaucratic. It was a 100,000 person company, is very large. And so career movement took a lot longer in that environment. So this was a company where people were there for 10, 15, 20 years. And there, there's nothing wrong with that environment, but that you have to then recognize and say, am I moving sort of at the speed I want to in this particular place? And so uh, for me, I, I wasn't. And so then that's actually uh, one of the reasons why I moved on and, and came to log me in, which definitely <laughs> moves fast. Um, but, but again, this is kind of the purpose of this, this map is to, to help you get a sense of, of what you value and what's important to you. Okay, and Linda has a question. What, it, what, are, what is with aspects of this map that are not in our control? Yeah, right, so I think, Linda, I don't know if I answered your question well, but I just gave an example where a company is large and slow and you as one person can't change that. But I think, you know what I'm gonna say here, what you can change is your situation to a certain extent. So um, does it mean switching to a new team within that same company that uh, maybe has a, a different style or does it mean that, hey, maybe it's time time to switch jobs or to find career satisfaction in other ways, uh, whether that's through uh, events like the one we're at tonight, so really kind of networking with others and um, building career satisfaction out of connecting with other people or participating in work topics uh, at conferences that are um, public, these are the different things you can think about for uh, things that feel out of your control. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah. So that uh, obviously kind of wraps it up for sort of what I what I wanted to share with you tonight. I was doing my best actually not to get too personal, and then I found like once I started talking, I was just like, oh, I just have to be real, and I'll just explain um yeah kind of my my true emotions around all of this but 
I hope it was uh, helpful. And yeah, I really enjoyed the questions you've asked. And um, obviously, we have some more time. So I'm happy to have more questions. Or honestly, if we want to kind of make this more collaborative, I'd love to hear from some of you, uh, either depending on your comfort level, kind of career challenges you may be struggling with, or I don't know, good career advice that you think is really um, relevant uh, based on some of the things you've heard tonight. I, I'd love to hear more from all of you as well. Um, well, I have a question. Um, you said you're an introvert. Um, do you think there is a difference between a, an introvert career and an extrovert career? And, and what are the strengths, for instance, of an uh, introvert? Because I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there are a lot. Yeah, and so great question. Uh, I think about this one a lot because um, I'm always observing the people I think who are really successful and to me they often are really great at thinking on their feet and in the moment sort of saying the right words and having the fast answers. And that is just not me, right? I'm, I'm one of those people I need to kind of go off on my own time and sort of think about things and then come back with an answer. So I think obviously there's introverts and extroverts who are both successful in their careers, uh, but I think they need to use different techniques. And so um, one of sort of one of the things I, I jokingly say to myself is, I'm not paid to be an introvert as a manager, right? So I, I know that's a little bit of a harsh way of putting it, but there are expectations of my job to connect with others and to sort of be on. And I will say that I'm actually okay with it when it comes to the work context. Um, for some reason, I'm able to think about sort of log me in or user experience as this thing I really enjoy doing. And so even though in my personal life, yeah, I have these feelings of shyness or yeah, oh, it, it drains me to, you know, talk to people after people all day long. I don't know why, but in the career context, my mind is able to switch it and say, I really enjoy doing this activity. And so even though normally, I would not expect that I can, you know, have eight hours of meetings every day with people all day nonstop. I, I, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what it, I don't know if I have an answer for you, but I can tell you that I am able to reframe or switch my approach so that in a work context, I don't mind. And so aspects of my introversion still come out, as I mentioned earlier, like, I, yeah, I don't feel like I, I think fast on my feet, but then I find other ways to, to work around that. So like finding someone who is a fast thinker and working with them so that when we present together, they can help me um, sort of sell the story or um, answer the, the questions in the moment that maybe I don't have the best answer to. It's because you're passionate about your job. I think it's you're in the flow mm -hmm. and then you forget about your shyness and everything. And mm -hmm. yeah. Have you ever had the experience where you feel like um, someone had an advantage over you in their career because this person was a social butterfly, was extroverted, was loud? Or you feel like you had almost like a disadvantage or didn't get a chance to prove yourself in the same way as this loud person did? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I have not experienced that directly, but I know what you're saying. Um, again, I, I try and think about it as, especially when you're both working, or when we're, when it's two people and you're both working for the same company, I try not and get obsessed, or I try and avoid feelings of jealousy because, in the end like whether it's promotions or sort of uh, getting recognition for a job well done. I know, well, so let me, this is, ah, <laughs> I'm losing my words now. So in terms of recognition, I generally don't care because whatever, like there's so many projects, there's so many things happening. Um, I don't, I don't feel like I need that pat on the back. Uh, but in terms of sort of when it's promotion time or it's annual review time, that's obviously a really critical time because 
you know, salaries are important and uh, that recognition that you are growing in your career um, is equally uh, is equally important. Um, you find ways to sell yourself, I'll say, beneath the surface, right? So I think this is similar to when I mentioned that um, when I was trying to find a job, I, I was more comfortable showcasing things through a portfolio or through written documents, right? You need to find the pathways where you excel at telling your story and use those. So yeah, I'm, I'm not ever going to sort of get up front and even, you know, for tonight's event, I love that Marie posted it all over the Slack channels um, at Log Me In and I, I didn't post it once because I was like, oh, I don't want to self-promote. Um, <laughs> But yeah, That's you you find cat image <laughs> right next to it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I made a screaming emoji. Um, you find other pathways, right? So this again, getting back to the principles of design thinking, there may be the loudest person in the room, the person who's taking taking all the air out, or always being like, "I'm so great, I'm so wonderful." If that's not your style naturally, don't change yourself to be like that person. Find workarounds and other avenues so that your work is still being shown and recognized and it doesn't have to be in that same way. Yeah, this is, you know, I'm, I'm asking this question because um, your example of like, um, I don't know, promotion discussions or mm -hmm. um, when you wanna get a salary increase or something like that, in you know, their mm -hmm. studies that men tend to be more self-confident and more um, in general just confident talking mm -hmm. about this topic and everything and I feel like since this group is women in tech group um, there are differences between the genders but I like your point that it doesn't mean that just because the loud and direct and self-confident way isn't your way that it means like you can't get to the same outcome or end goal. Yeah. The other piece of advice I would say, or what's worked really well for me, is I've had incredibly great managers. And so maybe this is actually where I've had an advantage is I've, across all the, my last two jobs, I've had managers who are always sort of looking for opportunities to showcase the value of what I do to other people. And I think this is the other key aspect when it, um, it comes to talking about promotions or recognition. I, it's actually not all your responsibility. Your manager, and sorry, full disclosure, Linda reports to me, everyone. So Linda, uh, feel free to give me a hard time. But um, it's your manager's responsibility. So my obligation is to help elevate your work across the executive channels, across different stakeholders, and to help raise you up So and everyone else on the team. So I would say if you're ever in a situation in a job where you're doing great work, um, but yeah, you're constantly feeling like it's not being recognized and you're trying different ways. There may be actually more of an issue with the particular team you're in or the manager you're working for where um, they don't realize or they don't know how, how they can be helping you. And so remember that it, it truly is not all on you to figure out. The work environment and the work culture needs to help lift, lift you up as well. So what if you're in a bad work environment? Is, the only, is there only one option and it's changing the environment to so move on? Or would you also, is it also possible to impact the current yeah. situation somehow? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I've definitely um, had a user experience job where um, at one point I was reporting to an engineering manager. And even though engineering and UX um, are our sister topics or they need to interact together. An engineering manager uh, tends to be focused much more on yeah, getting the product out and built and stuff about people and generating ideas they don't care much about. Um, so can, can you change someone? Um, I think you can try, right? So I definitely remember there were times where I tried to establish sort of a new process for, for how um, text on the screen could be translated. And it was really early. I was in my, um, you know, I don't know, 27 years old and, and thought I had sort of solved the problem. Uh, but what I, my approach was wrong in the sense that I was like, oh, I'm the smartest person in the room and I've solved the problem. And I didn't realize that you have to, yeah, you're young, you don't know. You have to sort of bring people along and not 
throw solutions at them. So I think when it comes to trying to shift behavior or improve a team culture, you first have to build relationship and trust with those people you want to change. You can't just come in with the, the solution or the smartest answer. They have to believe in it. And that's a really hard skill. So it's a skill I continue to work on today in terms of um, influencing people and sort of how do you take an idea that you know it's good and get others to believe in it. Um, work in progress. So I think that's how you do it. I think, yes, bad teams or sort of um, teams who, who may not understand the value of, of each member, I think it is possible for that to change. But it, um, it's not about having the answer, but actually influencing how they, how they think, and that's really hard to do. So, but people who are good at that, that is, wow, I want to learn more from you. So talking about building relationships, mm -hmm. and you touched upon an interesting topic about introversion. Um, I'm more of an ambivert, and depending on my energies, I struggle to build those relationships. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, and that's a new word for me. Did you say ambivert? Is that like you can be either one? Yeah, yeah. So as for personality tests, I'm 51% extroverted. So I'm just right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, I think it sounds like you have the best of both worlds. And so maybe it kind of depends um, what situation you're dealing with. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've actually never heard of ambivert. Uh, before, so thanks for for the new word. Um, I mean, I guess is there a particular situation that you're thinking about, or I guess how do you feel like you you shift the way you work throughout the day depending on uh, like sort of your mood or the situation? Yeah, like for instance, I know what are some of the tricks and tactics to kind of build relationships, but if you are in that introverted mindset you're just not able to do it because you probably don't have the energy to do it or something mm -hmm. like that. Got it. Yeah. Um, ooh, I don't know. Does anyone have an answer for Neha? I do not have an answer for that one. I think I'm an ambivert too. I have times where I'm super extroverted and then there are times where I just don't have the energy. And I think it's just about waiting a bit sometimes and then take the moment again. That would be one strategy to just, but in my opinion, it's not a disadvantage to be an introvert, for instance. That's why I was asking in the beginning, what are the strengths of an introvert? So like uh, Lisa said, there are, we have both parts and we can just make the best of it, I guess. Um, taking time for yourself, calming down thinking about a problem can also be a huge strength and not being extroverted all the time so i think it's about just being patient maybe and not to overthink mm -hmm. things right not to overthink or oh, what what should i say or how should i do it just do it right not, not thinking about everything i can relate to that to be honest like i have these moments also like like having introvert paces and i really enjoy them nowadays because i think it gives me time to take distance again so i i tend to not uh you know like tr try not to judge myself for that rather embrace it and then just see what comes with it so there's probably the distance that you can think about the process, reflect about what you did in the extrovert first and the other way around as well. So I try to profit from where I am at in the moment and just embrace it. I think I just could vote <laughs> for this because by me it sells the same and uh, I enjoy the moments uh, of these waves when uh, on the one way, if you can do one things and other things and a other pace, so I I find it also uh, quite good, I think. And I know of many women who only want to do things when they know they can do it perfectly. So I think we don't need to be perfect. So that's 
I think it's a women thing that they only want to do things or say things if they know it's right or 100% good or anything. So I think we shouldn't think in those dimensions, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like to add uh, to that. Uh, I already finished with dinner, so <laughs> I can turn my camera on. Uh, I'm from what Costa Rica. Sorry? What did you have? Ah, some tofu with rice and salad, yeah. <laughs> but I was making the tofu, so that took away. And anyways, uh, I'm from Costa Rica, and for me, it has been very difficult. I came here over a year. I am based in Hamburg, and right now I'm working at Gimdo, and my situation was um, like kind of um, challenging because for example, I, I, I think I can speak English in a way that people can understand what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> but I get frustrated all the time because not only with the German, because we speak English at, 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 the, um, at the company, but uh, sometimes it, it, it frustrates me a lot because I cannot communicate the way that I will do it in Spanish, right? Of course. Um, and also, I feel that I, I'm sometimes in disadvantage because of that. Um, in Costa Rica, for example, I, I, had, I was in, in a very successful company. And when I came here, uh, and I was leading a team, I was the head of design in there, and then when I decided to come to Germany, I said, okay, probably not the best because I'm coming from a small country, right? Nobody knows uh, what I was doing and nobody knows about Costa Rica and the startup that I was, even when it's very successful in the region. So I decided to say, okay, I'm just going to go for a product designer career right now, even when I was already leading a team and building a new company. <laughs> um, and now I'm frustrated because I feel all these different things like the English. Sometimes I'm also introvert and I can be very extrovert as well. And I'm trying to balance that. Um, and the thing that I sometimes I cannot like express myself to say what I'm thinking uh, or at, at least the way that I want, like right now, <laughs> it makes me very anxious and I want to go back to the leading phase. I don't want to be a product manager, but I would love to lead the design team, for example. And right now, I don't, I don't know how to get there uh, with, I know they have the, the skills there, but somehow the communication right now, it's been kind of like hard for me, I, or I don't feel that I'm very, that I'm that professional enough to get that, uh, that step. So I don't know if some one of you have experienced this or, or have any tips for that, because that what you said resonates a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, with me that sometimes we just want to make it perfect right um, and we just need to do it but that sometimes i have a lot of trouble doing that <laughs> i think learning to not being perfect is one of the most important things in life because um when i started out I, i'm, I'm self-employed now so um that's not a problem anymore but um during my trainee time, it, it was really hard for me to to accept um, to accept failure or to accept that I'm not perfect. And when I noticed that most of the clients are very happy when you give 80% and not 100%, there still are possibilities to to improve, but not um, in a kind of I I have to be perfect, but just a little more next time, a little more next time, and not to, to focus too much on, on the possibility of failure. So um, I, I totally understand even uh, what Lisa said before, um, because um, she answered my question, um, that the most, um, yeah, the thing that stands in the way is the language. And I think that's, that's interesting for us, because um, 
Yeah, for me, it's, it's not a problem because I can speak German, I can speak English, I'm learning Chinese. So, um, yeah, <laughs> language is language and um, you have to find a way to communicate um, what, what you're thinking. And I think the most important thing for learning a new language is to understand how you think in that language. Mm. Um, kind of, Lucia can talk about this a little bit more, maybe. <laughs> Um, I'm coming from a bi bilingual background, so my mother tongue is actually sign language. My mother's, my parents are deaf, so I grew up in an env environment where I, where my environment was German, but my family spoke a different language, and I can con completely relate with any kind of struggle in that. Um, I can just repeat myself, be patient, take your time, accept that, accept imperfections, accept, uh, believe, trust that people are open-minded. You will always find people who, uh, who who tolerate it, that you're not perfect and you're not, you don't have to be perfect at all. And more, a lot of people are curious about your culture, about your language, about, um, the way you think because probably it's a different mindset you have and a different um yeah way you where you see the uh, see the world and this is very interesting to those who have only the let's say the german mindset uh, which is sometimes a bit uh how do you square <laughs> um um and i think it's just a huge advantage that you have this background and see it as an advantage and not as a disadvantage or something you will always find ignorant people everywhere but that's just how it is and don't follow them just accept it accept them to be stay patient but to focus on the positive sides and yeah i think that's what i learned from my from my past and from um that also the world is changing that's another thing that really most people in german do speak english and um we are becoming more and more multicultural here as well so um, especially in this field of tech you would find a lot of uh, internationals um yeah and uh, yeah these days and probably for the future i don't see any um problem with only speaking english of course you will always find those who are who have we we as germans ourselves have are struggling with the, with English sometimes, and not everyone is um, perfect with this. But and we are aware of it. And yeah, but just yeah, don't take it too strictly. We're not. It's not code. <laughs> we don't have to be perfect with every. Yeah, um, yeah it, but yeah. It, it's funny because um, I mean I understand. And I and and I always try. Actually, right now I'm trying. Just for example, like when I'm writing in Slack, before I was like checking the spelling and everything like hundred times, and it took me like twenty minutes to send a two lines message. <laughs> um, but right now I'm just like doing it. Yeah, like you said. Um, but it was funny once I talked with a colleague because. Um, also, when they reach, uh, reach out, they offered me a lead position, but then I didn't get it because they said that um, I, they wanted more experience, let's say, and then they, but they gave me this, um, this opportunity to come as a product designer and then just to, to build my career path in there, which was uh, very nice and I took it. Um, but then I was talking with a colleague, a, design, a designer, and he told me like, uh, probably he's he's from England, and he's like when you when you listen to this guy, he's super smart. Like everything he says, even when it's like bullshit, it just sounds smart, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's super geek, and and he told me, Jules, you know what? Um, now that I know you, and, and don't get me wrong, but I think that if you will be me, like in my body, 
like white guy with the British accent, he told me that you will you will probably uh, get the the position, do it position because you have everything in there. So that made me like whoa, <laughs> think about it, you know. And then I I felt like. Why? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps it's my English, or perhaps it's the way that I communicate, or perhaps it's because I'm a woman. I don't know. But those things are very shocking. And even more when somebody else from your team said it to you face to face. So, I mean, um, it, I don't know how to solve this, right? It's, it's very what is What his position, yours? What, what's the guy's position that said that to you? Um, he's a peer. He is also a design, uh, a designer, product designer. So you can ask him back why he doesn't have a lead position then, when he feels like you would have it if he would be, if you would be in his body basically, and also be a man. Why does he not have it then? Yeah, because he doesn't want it, and um, yeah, he's more like from the technique part, but. Um, but I'm pretty sure probably if he will, it will be a nice experiment to see, you know, <laughs> if he applies like, okay, what happens? Um, but yeah, in, in, in right now, for example, I'm taking a lot of, re a lot of uh, nice challenges in the company, but yeah, this, this is just something and, and I just wanted to share it with you because I'm pro yeah, we are, we won't like solve anything in here, but I think this is kind of like interesting for us like women, uh, that we are in this tech area, um, that these, these cases are real <laughs> and, and we really need to fight a little bit more than other guys to get those kind of positions. So Lisa, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you have a lot of nice experiences and learnings that, that you can share. Because then you can share because, yeah, like for me in Costa Rica, it, it was also a fight to get there, but I did it uh, and I was very proud of it. But now I feel like I have to take the battle again and I'm kind of like tired as well. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to share that thought. But thank you so much. Uh, words of encouragement are also good to hear in here. Definitely. Um, well, actually, my, uh, I'm sorry, my favorite thing that uh, Lucia said that um, was a learning for me as well coming to Germany, your differences are sort of what you think is a disadvantage. So the fact that, yeah, Germans maybe your third or, four, or fourth language and that culturally you come from a very uh, different uh, environment than, than Germany. I didn't realize when I was hired at LogMeIn that I'll say my Americanism was actually perceived as a good thing. So I was stressed out so much when I was applying for jobs in Germany uh, because I was like, I don't speak German. There's so many talented, wonderful people in Germany. Who is going to choose me? Like there's, I don't have anything better to offer and I lack the language skills. And then what ended up happening was, uh, you know, again, through my persistent online applications and, and hopefully through personal networking in the future, um, I, I found this great position at LogMeIn where because it is an American tech company, though has a great engineering team here in Germany, their market focus is the United States. And so what was what I thought was a disadvantage was actually exactly what they wanted. They wanted someone who was going to be different working with the German teams here. And so really to Lucy's point, embrace that. And it's um, don't try and change yourself to fit like the British guy mold or fit the expectations of what a leader is supposed to be. I think that's one of the things I've been most happy about when we talk about sort of yeah, getting tired of sort of fighting all the time or having to personally change everyone's mindset. I think one of the biggest advantages I've seen shift in corporate culture over the last years is, is this focus on diverse thinking and diversity and inclusion. And while we typically think that means sort of like outward appearances or, or, or different genders, honestly, I think it also includes different approaches. And so I, you know, I don't like when I hear things like, oh yeah, women should speak up more, or women need to be more assertive. I think if you have a particular speaking style and um, that is how you, and assuming it's professional and clear, 
you don't need to change that to fit the expectations. What needs to change is those other people being able to listen to you and recognize the value you bring. And so this is um, this kind of notion of everyone having biases, and we, we all have biases, is uh, really like to our advantage in the sense that we don't have to do this fight by ourselves anymore, like co corporate culture is shifting. So I think that's one piece of hope I can, I can give you is that don't beat yourself up. Obviously we all wanna improve in different ways, but don't feel like you fundamentally have to change yourself. It's the people around you who need to, who need to change, honestly. And maybe on that um, on that language barrier thing, um, we had locked me in only speak English or mainly speak English. And I was talking to a friend of mine who also speaks English at his job and is a native German speaker. And he read an article that we have different personalities depending on the language that we speak, because we have a different set of words that we have available and um, different levels of words. So I don't have probably as sophisticated words in English available um, as I have in German. And so the way I'm communicating in English, I might be less, I don't know, self-confident or less assertive or less because I just don't have the words available. And um, he said what he keeps on doing to kind of keep the same personality is that um, when he thinks about that, he wants to bring across uh, a point across to someone, he first thinks in German and then tries to translate it one to one, exactly like what he tries to say, instead of just letting it go and thinking in English and then trying to say uh, what he was thinking in English, maybe used to your point, thinking in Spanish and thinking about what would the manager or the team lead you will say now and then translate it in English and try to bring your point across in that way to kind of have this comfortable native language speaking personality set of words available. But I, can, I can't imagine how, how hard it must be to come to, um, and German is super hard to speak and to learn. And I'm glad that I don't have to do it, but um, yeah, it's, it's maybe a trick that you can try to come around that point, but um, I don't know if it always works. Yeah, thank you. The German, it's, I really like it, but yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but thank you. Is there time for another question? Because I have a non so personal one. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Lisa, if your approach to, to how you use things uh, changed over the time that you work with UX because um, you you think in in user experiences and is it is it a kind of change in your personal behavior then? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll share my screen again. But uh, your mindset will even change if you uh, read the book that I mentioned early on. I'll show it real quickly again. Uh, the design of everyday things. Uh, because one of the things you start to do once you're aware of sort of the structure, the layout, the shape, um, the psychology of how people think, uh, one of the things I realized I forgot to mention is user experience is really a combination of sort of understanding how people think and then sort of the physicality of space in terms of how people move, what they can reach and touch. And so, yeah, there's uh, especially, um, I remember after I finished reading this book, um, I was always paying attention to door handles because uh, this book gives an example where some door handles make it really obvious whether you uh, I'll t attempt German, sehen oder drücken, and so, or I probably did the motions wrong. Um, and so, yeah, you, you notice a lot more about sort of the world around you uh, once you're, um, once you're exposed to some of the principles. And so, yeah, I really would say that user experience is not just a topic um, for building software, but it's a topic that can apply, as we've been talking about, not only to your own career, but sort of how you move through through spaces and sort of appreciate the, the beauty of things and also whether they functionally work well, because oftentimes there can be something that's beautifully designed but that is so complicated to use, probably some Bosch stoves or ovens that are seem like they're perfect. And then you're like, how do I turn this on, right? Yeah, UX helps you sort of think through all of that. Great, cool. All right, 
Um, well, as I mentioned, I will definitely share the slides out, um, and I'll just point out a added, yeah, um, just a couple more references. Oops, sorry, messing my screen sharing up. Um, a couple more references at the end here. Uh, so Stanford, the university in the United States, has a free online course called Designing Your Career. I tried to load it up and get it to work. I couldn't. Hopefully, you'll be more successful than me. But if you enjoyed the uh, activity we did today, I imagine they have things like that uh, as part of this free online course. And then uh, there's books, you know, uh, available for, uh, in both German and English all around sort of designing your life and how to use UX principles or design thinking for your career. So everything that I've shared today is really based on um, a lot of work that's out there in the world. Um, so even that specific career exercise, I was I adapted that from um, from an article I read online. So feel free to make use of these resources, and uh, hopefully we'll find I'll find ways to sort of um, yeah figure out what we want and how we want it based on our ambivert, introvert, extrovert. Styles. I think the key point here is that there's no one right way. You keep trying things, you reflect on it, and then you try again until until you have it in a way that you like it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, well, then I guess we close this meetup, meet the go to meeting for tonight. Would be great to see you again, maybe in real life or another online meetup. Um, yeah, I really appreciated your time and the input you gave all of us. And I think um, I can speak for all of us in this case, unless you guys or girls or women <laughs> have another question or something to say as well. I don't want to be the only one who's speaking. I just wanted to ask uh, if somebody is in the north right now, like me in Hamburg or Berlin, something like that. No? Or everybody is? Um, if you want to, you can join our Facebook group, Women in Tech, D-A-C-H, -D DACH. We have a lot of uh, women in tech in Hamburg as well, and you, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to connect with them over there. Okay. I don't use Facebook that much, but okay, okay. Exactly. Oh, yeah, it's on Facebook, yeah, but um, yeah, that's the only, right now it's the only uh, way to, like, I can, I only know this way. Um, there are no physical meetups these days, I think. I'm not sure, but do you know more, Lisa? If you are follow there? us um, on, on the website, um, on any uh, channel you like, so if you'd like um, Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever, <laughs> um, or just um, subscribe to the newsletter, then you'll get to know um, if there's a meetup, for example, in Hamburg or anywhere near you. And... Um, as soon as our um, members will be present on our website, they, they fill out the, the public profile. Yeah. Um, you can, you we can used check that to have, out. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. We used to have physical meetups before COVID-19, and now we uh, changed, switched to this, these digital um, events. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I also enjoyed, enjoyed the physical ones. It was really nice. Okay. Thank Something you. Else? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I look forward to participating in more of these meetups. And for those of you here tonight, uh, again, feel free to stay in touch. And hopefully, I'll see you uh, all at the next meetup. Okay. Great. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. All right. Thank, Thank you. So Bye. 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 Bye.